Uh, how's my volume level? Uh, pretty good. You could be a little closer, maybe. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Dean. Hello, and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. If you are not on NOAA's weekly seminar list, but you'd like to be, just let me know or Google NOAA Seminar to find out more. And so today is the fourth in an eight-part climate science seminar series co-hosted by Katie Reeves of the U.S. Global Change Research Program and myself, Tracy Gill, from NOAA. I'm going to provide a few logistics about today's seminar, and then Katie will introduce the seminar and the speaker. Uh, a reminder to participants, well, if you're on, you know this. We've switched to Adobe Connect so that we can accommodate more participants and so that we can record the seminar. Um, we will be posting a record, the recording and possibly a PDF of the presentation in a few days, and we will post a link to the recordings in the chat box. Um, and you can also get the links to the earlier recordings um, on the, in the chat box at that link. So about questions, you can ask questions in the chat box, and we will address them at the end. Or if Bradley sees them and he has time, he will address them during the talk. People in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And now Katie's going to introduce our seminar and the presenter. Katie, take it away. Thanks, Tracy. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. As Tracy noted, today is the fourth installment of the Climate Science Special Report webinar series. My name is Katie Reeves, and I'm the Engagement and Communications Lead for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. The Global Change Research Act of 1990 mandated that USGCRP, quote, assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. One way we do that is through the development of a quadrennial national climate assessment. The Climate Science Special Report, which is the focus of this eight-part series, represents volume one of the fourth national climate assessment. The report assesses the science of climate change with a focus on the United States, and it serves as the foundation for Volume 2 of the assessment, scheduled for release late this year, which will look at climate-related impacts, risks, and adaptation across the U.S. The Climate Science Special Report was released in November of 2017, and you can read and download it at science2017.globalchange.gov, and I'll put that in the chat box um, when I'm finished. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Radley Horton, who will present on Potential Climate Surprises, Compound Extremes, and Tipping Elements. Dr. Horton's research focuses on climate extremes, tail risks, climate impacts, and adaptation. He currently co-chairs Columbia's Adaptation Initiative and is the lead principal investigator for the NOAA Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Funded Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast whew, and the WWF Columbia University Advanced Partnership. Dr. Horton is the Columbia University lead for the Department of Interior funded Northeast Climate Adaptation Center, and he has served as deputy lead for NASA's Climate Adaptation Science Investigator Working Group, charged with linking NASA's science to its institutional stewardship. And that's not all. He teaches in Columbia University's Sustainable Development Department and is a leading climate science communicator, appearing regularly on television, radio, and in print. And with that, thank you, Dr. Horton, for joining us on today's NOAA Science Seminar. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, it's, it's great to have the chance to speak with uh, all of you today about what is um, a very exciting, um, if somewhat disturbing, for sure, um, topic. I think um, we're going to have a chance to uh, get in today to some of the elements from the Climate Science Special Report that um, you know, haven't, haven't been reported that much in um, prior assessments or, or emphasized in prior assessments um, at the national scale or, or internationally. So um, some of the material is a little bit more um, sort of speculative and at the vanguard, but I'm going to make a case um, that from a risk management perspective, it's uh, absolutely critical that we think about um, these types of compound extremes and tipping elements that I'll define uh, shortly. Okay, uh, moving to slide two. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to be talking about one small component of the Climate Science Special Report. Um, you can see the URL uh, down below here. Um, but I do, before jumping into um, my remarks, want to quickly contextualize, hit a couple of the key themes um, that we've heard from some of the other speakers in this series and that we'll, we'll, we'll hear again. First and foremost, in a sense, this you know 500-page uh, report really can be summarized um, in one perhaps long sentence. Uh, climate change is real. We are the primary driver um, behind the changes that we've been observing uh, since the Industrial Revolution 
It's posing serious challenges today, everywhere, uh, US and internationally, and that the window of time to prevent the most widespread uh, dangerous impacts is closing. So um, going now to the next slide, um, we're going to be talking about chapter 15 today. That is part of this much uh, broader report. Um, I have the uh, authors for the chapter uh, cited at the bottom of the slide. And just to highlight that I'm one of, of several authors, um, much of what I'm saying will be taken um, directly from the chapter. But I am also going to uh, use the platform to extend a little bit um, uh, beyond some of the things that we talked about um, in, the, in our chapter. So uh, any errors along that way are, are entirely mine. Uh, not the not the fault of, of the authors, including um, you know Bob Kopp as, as as the leader of this chapter. And yes, yeah, so this is a chapter within the Climate Science Special Report. In a sense, the first report you could say, uh, the first part of the upcoming National Climate Assessment. As we heard later this year and early next year, um, we'll be getting uh, a release of uh, of a report and chapters focused much more on on impacts and solutions than. Um, this first report focused uh, largely on the on the climate science. Okay, so this risk management framework, um, you know, all decisions, all long-term planning um, faces uncertainty, and as we're trying to think about um, what we should try to plan for, um, on the one hand, we need to think about the probability of an event um, occurring, and if I can get this cursor to work here. You could see sort of on this axis, uh, ranging from a low probability to a high probability of a particular climate change, let's say. Let's call it one degree of global warming, for example. Um, we could also think about this dimension here related to impacts. We could quibble about exactly what an impact is. Is an extreme weather event an impact or a climate hazard? It really depends how you define it. Um, but for any hazard or any impact, we can imagine that there's a magnitude of consequence. And any time that the probability of a hazard occurring is high and the consequences, should it occur, are also high, we're in a kind of red zone um, for which you might really want to consider changing your pathway, whether it's reducing greenhouse gas emissions and concentrations or planning, um, preparing, investing, for some of the climate changes that there's a high probability that you're that you're locked into. So I'm going to start out by quickly reviewing um, what I think we've heard about um, in some of the prior seminars. Some of the climate changes that we're already locked into, that are virtually certain to occur, and that are probably going to have some major uh, consequences. That's going to be sort of a reminder. Then we're going to quickly jump into the heart of this talk, which is about tipping points and compound extremes, something harder to define, where in general there's going to be a little more uncertainty about just how likely these things are to happen, um, when they might happen. But the examples we're going to highlight, should they happen, are going to be extremely high consequence, arguably even catastrophic, in ways that probably from a risk management perspective justify thinking about them, even if they were relatively low probability. But as we'll see, and really the reason that we have this chapter for the first time on tipping points and compound extremes, there's growing evidence um, that the probability of, of some of these types of events, unfortunately, is not low. Um, it's high. And we're seeing more and more evidence that um, the climate models that underlie a lot of our projections may have been underestimating some of these risks, a case of where uncertainty um, is not our friend from a planning perspective. So first, the quick review, though, of what we know pretty well, the linear, well-behaved stories at this point. So greenhouse gas concentrations, we know carbon dioxide up over 40% now relative to pre-industrial, 405 parts per million, as, as reported in, in, in NOAA's 2017 release yesterday. What is that doing? Um, we've had roughly one degree Celsius of global warming since late in the 19th century when we started to have decent um, temperature measurements. That's in the global average. How could one degree of Celsius matter? How could what sounds like such a small change um, uh, impact uh, systems we care about and, and things that we're vulnerable to? Well, one way to think about that 
is through the impact that one degree of warming can have on the frequency, the statistics of extreme weather events, particularly heat waves. If we look at this right tail, we can see how if the distribution, if the variability stays the same, moving from a baseline climate to a temperature that's just, a, to a climate that's just a little bit warmer, just a couple degrees warmer, we can see that small increase in average temperature can lead to a big change in the frequency depicted on the y-axis here. This is the frequency of occurrence. Things up here happen often, things down here are rare. With a little bit of warming, becomes much more common to get those really hot days, for example, that, that society is so, is so vulnerable to. And we're already seeing um, uh, these changes. The take home message here, a small average change, a degree of warming, the eight inches of sea level rise that we've seen since the last century, already having a big impact on the frequency with which we're experiencing extreme events like high temperatures and coastal flooding. Let's look at that high temperature story quickly. And again, this is not within my chapter. I just want to quickly remind you about it to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. Again, with that one degree of warming, that's been enough to profoundly alter this ratio of how often uh, about 1,800 weather stations in the U.S. are experiencing record-breaking high temperatures relative to record-breaking low temperatures. Ever since you know 2000, um, if you, you can still find a couple of years um, shown in blue where there were more cold extremes uh, than warm, but the statistics have clearly shifted. This is not the climate of the past when we talk about extremes. And as we plan for the future, we have to plan um, uh, for these shifted statistics. We want to average across a lot of places, average over time. A better strategy is going to be to plan for, for these changes. And as we'll see, as greenhouse gas concentrations continue to rise, that's going to be more of an increase, actually, in an acceleration um, of some of these changes. This is all observed data, no projections yet. But it's not just the change in average temperature. What's the story? How does that eight inches of sea level rise globally translate into profound shift in the frequency of coastal flooding events? Let's look again, historical data first, um, uh, two cities on opposite sides of the U.S., 1960 to 2010 in Charleston and in San Francisco. Already we're seeing um, for some of these locations five-fold or more increase in the frequency of these nuisance flooding days, these days where people who live along the coast can't drive home by their typical route, maybe they have a little bit of water in their basement, maybe in some cases it, it interrupts sort of daily business operations. These are becoming much more common, and with just a little bit of sea level rise in the future, uh, they become far more common still. You can see, for example, Charleston in recent years getting something like 30 or more um, days um, of, this, of this nuisance flooding relative to a baseline of perhaps you know, five such days per year or less um, just two generations ago. All with eight inches, maybe a little more sea level rise for, for Charleston for reasons that I can't, uh, can't get into here. Um, but still the, the bottom line holds. Small change in average, big change um, in the frequency of extremes. We can also see this as we look out to the future shown on the right here for more catastrophic flood events. Uh, so not the nuisance flooding here, but they're really sort of game-changing um, high water levels. What this is showing you is for tide gauges across the entire U.S., with two feet of sea level rise, um, which you know would be, as we'll see, sort of a lucky scenario, but that's about the best we can hope for uh, for this century. We're essentially locked in probably to more sea level rise than that. But even if we got lucky, if we just got two feet of sea level rise, if we just had the storms of the past, we don't have to invoke stronger hurricanes, stronger nor'easters, just with the storms of the past, two feet of sea level rise by raising the floor turns high water levels that used to happen once every 100 years into things that in some parts of the U.S. we could be experiencing roughly once every year or two. And even under the best case kind of scenarios, you can see some of these areas here in the, in the lighter green, what used to be a one in a hundred year high water level, something you expect to experience during the lifetime of the, of the typical residential mortgage. So here again, small shifts in average conditions leading to large changes in the frequency of potentially devastating extremes. This is about as airtight a story as you can tell. Um, you know, we're basically locked into these changes. We've understood this science um, for decades. The big questions now are around the consequences, just how nonlinear um, are the responses going to be when we start to think about the implications of things like 
postal real estate values, uh, potential for migration, um, insecurity uh, around the world. So that's the sort of well understood um, baseline. Um, and, and there's obviously from a risk management perspective, some really alarming components there. But at this point, essentially indisputable that, you know, we've had that degree of warming, we're locked into another half degree, and we've just seen um, how it's changing the, the, the frequency of extremes. And, and we can talk later about how, how extreme the consequences are, are going to be. Now, we're going to shift gears, stop talking about what we understand really well, what we're essentially locked into, and move into a more speculative realm, uh, a region where uh, we're talking about topics that climate models may not be able to simulate that well, um, a region where there's the potential for key <coughs> processes, including positive feedbacks, whereby an initial change leads to more change in the same direction. What are we learning um, for some key systems um, around the planet? Um, is, there, is there evidence that we could be seeing the potential for rapid changes outside of the realm um, of what climate models might have, might have told us is likely? In those instances, what other types of information can we use to plan? Um, and, and what should we be, keep, be keeping track on um, uh, as we look to the future? That is the subject um, of this talk. So again, reminding ourselves, carbon dioxide concentrations up more than 40% since the pre-industrial. Um, that is turning up the dial. The further we push the system, the less the planet looks like um, what we had experienced when we designed all our climate models, you know, what we've, what, we've, what we've known. The further we push the system, the greater the potential for positive feedbacks uh, and other surprises. So that's a good place to launch into the key messages uh, for this talk and from, um, from, our, from our chapter. While climate models incorporate important climate processes that can be well quantified, they do not include all of the processes that can contribute to feedbacks, compound extreme events, and abrupt and or irreversible changes. Future changes outside the range projected by climate models cannot be ruled out. That's the key sort of risk management um, point as we, as we think about planning for, for multiple futures. Moreover, the systematic tendency of climate models to underestimate temperature change during warm paleoclimates, these are uh, distant periods um, uh, in Earth's history, suggests that climate models are more likely to underestimate than overestimate the amount of long-term uh, future change. The models don't seem to be sensitive enough um, at these long time scales to changes in greenhouse gas uh, concentrations. In the past, relatively small shifts in greenhouse gas concentrations have led to big changes in things like sea level and temperature uh, globally and in, in various regions. Okay, um, let's now uh, get into more of the meat um, of this chapter. Uh, positive feedbacks, also known as self-reinforcing cycles within the climate system, have the potential to accelerate human-induced climate change. Some feedbacks are probably still unknown. The physical and socioeconomic impacts of compound extreme events can be greater than the sum of the parts. Few analyses to date have considered the spatial or temporal correlation, the relationship in space and time between extreme events. If instead of viewing extreme events in isolation, we consider these relationships in terms of their impacts, but also how the relationships could change in the future, the relationship between the actual physical occurrence of extreme events, we could see uh, surprises as well. And again, future changes outside the range projected by climate models cannot be ruled out. So what you can see here in this graphic are some of the examples of key uh, iconic uh, aspects of the climate system um, and of ecosystems, things like coral reefs and rainforests, which we can think of as ecological systems, um, but also as key uh, in a coupled way, very, very coupled with the climate system. So we'll look at, you know, for a few of these systems, what's the evidence that changes could be happening faster um, than our models suggest? What's the basis for concern about positive feedbacks, whereby an initial change driven by our increase in greenhouse gases and the associated warming could lead to further changes that then cause more change in the system in a way that maybe leads to, to, to more warming. Those are the kind of things that we're going to be uh, talking about 
before we shift gears and then talk about compound extreme events uh, during the later part um, of the talk. Okay, so when we think about a tipping element, um, what does this mean? It can be helpful to, to see this kind of, of schematic. Um, do I still have control of the cursor here? Yeah, it looks like I do. Okay, so generally speaking, this is an oversimplification for sure, but let's say that our planet right now is essentially in this state here. This is a state whereby if you nudge the system in one direction, maybe turned up greenhouse gas concentrations due to human activity or at a longer time scale perhaps, um, you know, for some other re reason, over time, the system would tend to nudge its way back to where it started. That's what you call a negative feedback. So if you get a sort of initial pulse in one direction or the other, a little bit of warming, a little bit of increase in greenhouse gases, or alternatively, a little bit of cooling, a little decrease in greenhouse gases, there'd be a stability that would tend to push the system back to where it started. So the current concern here, and then this again is, you know, to be clear, is an oversimplification. Um, what if we ramp up greenhouse gas concentrations so much, reminding ourselves that they're now higher than they've been in, in millions of years? Would we be able to see when we were approaching a tipping point in advance where the system would shift, whereby once you hit that point, if you kept pushing greenhouse gases a little bit higher, temperature a little higher, instead of, and then taking your foot off the brake, instead of falling back to where you started, you might cascade further into another system, whereby even if you then took your foot off the brake, stopped applying additional greenhouse gases, you would nevertheless still run away to a different climate state. Presumably the planet is not going to turn into a Venus. We're not concerned here about things boiling off. There, We know, given the lifetime of the history, that there are, at some time scales, responding factors that prevent, you know, total runaways. Um, but in the context of our society, population that we have today, with the stressors we're putting on the environment, to the extent that we push ourselves to dramatically different states that we haven't experienced in our evolutionary history, or of many species, um, it's a very open question, um, you know, what the consequences would be for us and, and whether we could handle it from a risk management um, perspective. So this is the notion of the positive uh, feedback. So now let's talk a little bit um, about some of the particular elements of the climate system that people have honed in on as they think about, as they worry about uh, possible uh, tipping points. We're not unfortunately gonna have time to get into all of these in this talk, although I encourage people to look, uh, look at the chapter. We will talk um, about uh, the great ice sheets and their implications on sea level rise. We will talk a little bit about Arctic sea ice and we'll talk very briefly um, about uh, fire and drought risk generally, which you could argue is sort of a component of this uh, more, more different example of the Amazon rainforest towards the bottom. We'll also talk briefly about the oceans and, and coral reefs. Okay, um, so the sea level rise example, I think this has been you know, really influential to the community because um, what's really become clear and accepted, whether you're a um, you know, manager for uh, New York City, you name it. For sea level rise, it, it's become clear that climate models can't possibly uh, tell us all the future outcomes. They actually do a pretty good job when it comes to how much the upper ocean is going to warm, how much the ocean is going to expand as temperatures rise. We think that's something climate models do pretty well. But it's become clearer and clearer that they cannot capture um, what's happening on the land-based uh, ice sheets. We're observing more rapid um, uh, melting uh, of those ice sheets. We're observing melting happen happening in ways that um, probably fair to say we couldn't even conceive of until we started to, to observe them. Really, the modeling community um, uh, is, is trying to sort of keep up with, with, with what we're observing. And as a result, it's become um, pretty much well accepted in risk assessment, including the, the, the projections for the Climate Science Special Report you can't just rely on climate models. You've got to look at paleoclimate history. You've got to look at local process models for ice sheets. You've got to look at expert judgment even. And you've got to consider scenarios to some extent that consider risk. If you're planning for something that, um, you know, some critical infrastructure you can't afford to lose, something with a 100-year lifetime, um, 
you might want to consider low probability, uh, high impact um, events. So how does all this relate to uh, tipping points? Let's talk um, a little bit about that. Um, keeping in mind that sea level rise projections, um, especially at that sort of high end, when we think about that worst case scenario, have been creeping upwards um, in, in recent years, as we observe, as I say, more and more ways that these land-based ice sheets uh, appear to be uh, becoming uh, compromised. So one example um, is what's referred to as marine ice sheet uh, instability. So this is basically the idea um, that if a certain amount of the ice sheet um, is undermined, go with, go with the cursor again here, and it could be undermined because um, essentially a dam, a buttress um, is being thinned from below as the ocean warms or as currents change pushing back this grounding line. So the situation we find, especially in parts of Antarctica, is that there is such a huge weight of ice that it has actually depressed the land surface underneath it. And as a result, you have this perhaps counterintuitive result that as you move inland from the ocean, you have this initial kind of ridge. But if you push far enough, or if the ice retreats enough in the presence of a warming ocean or a warming atmosphere, you could reach an unstable point whereby any further loss of ice enables the water to flow further underneath, further undermining the ice above, pushing it further back in a runaway process. Now, importantly, this, you know, intuitively, maybe that's not the word for it, but one could look at this and think, God, once this started, it could happen in a year or 10 years or 100 years. That is not the case. Even though this is a positive feedback and an instability, it's important to remember that we think this is an instability on the timescales of hundreds to thousands of years. But we also need to remember that in Antarctica, we're talking about potentially on the order of 75 feet maybe of sea level rise that could be, could be vulnerable to these types of processes. So if we even got 5% of that, um, three and a half feet roughly, that would be a game changer uh, for our sea level rise. Um, projections. So this is an instability. Climate models cannot capture these fine-scale processes. Um, so that's one example. A related example, but, but distinct. Um, sometimes in the near grounding lines, sometimes not. Anywhere you have instances of these very tall cliff faces, they become undermined, again, by warming ocean, presumably, but, but, but potentially atmosphere too. A little bit of this shears off for some reason. What's left behind is not stable. Um, if, the, if this ice sheet is too tall without enough support underneath it, it will keep carving off. It's a runaway process. That's another of these components um, that we're thinking more and more about that you know, 15, 20 years ago, I think it's fair to say was not on uh, you know, many, people's, many people's radar. And it's not just this marine ice sheet instability um, and these sort of ice cliffs engaging with the ocean. We can also think about, for example, the Greenland ice sheet, um, areas that are, that are further inland. We're learning more and more that this isn't just a simple energy balance um, equation. If for some reason, a little bit of warming, for example, you start to accumulate some water on the surface, or if you have some small melting and then refreezing that darkens um, the ice as a consequence, that can be a positive feedback, encouraging further warming through absorption of sunlight by this dark surface. Turns out there are pathways for that water to make its way to the base of the ice sheet where it meets land in this case, not the ocean. Lubricate that contact point between the ice sheet uh, and the land with water. It's clear that to some extent, there's gonna be less friction than there was before, faster movement, downslope, Towards the ocean, uh, where sea levels are, where, where the elevation is going to be lower and it's going to be going to be warmer. That's another of these um, of these feedbacks that um, you know we don't fully understand again exactly when they kick in, exactly how fast they're going to be. Um, but as we'll see, there's you know a lot of evidence at this point that we may have either uh, reached or quickly be approaching points of no return. Again, not in the time scale of you know they're all going to melt in a few years or ten years, but given the amount of ice involved um, over time scales of you know, the next couple generations, certainly by 2100, 
They could become key elements of our, our risk management that could determine whether our worst case scenario of sea level rise is four feet or eight, which we can tell is a game changer. I already showed you how eight inches to a foot of sea level rise um, uh, has such an Im impact on the frequency of coastal flooding. You could imagine what uncertainties in the context of, of, of three or four feet uh, can do. And again, you can't just blithely think of uncertainty as our friend here. Um, you know, given the preponderance of evidence suggesting that uh, climate models at least tend to sort of underestimate these sensitivities. Okay, shift gears now, um, talk a little bit, still in the context of tipping points. Now we're going to talk about Arctic sea ice. Um, so a few things here. Um, we've seen very rapid loss um, of this Arctic sea ice, which of course sits on the Arctic Ocean. When this ice melts, it essentially has no impact directly on sea level, uh, very, very minimal, although there could be some, some indirect impacts. But some things that are interesting to, to take into context here, if we go back to the IPCC reports of 2007 and earlier, um, the assumption really was that 2100 was about the soonest when during the summer months, especially for late August and September when we expect to see the annual sea ice minimum, 2100 was about the soonest that you could essentially go uh, ice-free. That was the assumption. Then um, in 2007 and again in 2012, we saw rapid um, and large drops um, in Arctic sea ice area. Partial recoveries thereafter, but much bigger drops um, than what anybody really thought possible, certainly what any climate models had been projecting. The IPCC then in the 2013 report said, well, maybe 2050 um, is the soonest that the Arctic could possibly, the sea ice could possibly go away again uh, in summer. If we look at the latest modeling studies, um, and again, engaging with some of the sort of expert judgment, because climate models have underestimated uh, what we've been observing, we can't rule out the idea that we could see an ice-free summer um, sometime in the next decade or two. Not claiming that that's the most likely scenario, but from a risk management perspective, this looks like a real possibility, something that, that can't be ruled out. And 10 years ago, we, you know, we didn't think that was the case. Why does this matter? Why highlight it? You know, one reason is because it's such an obvious example of a positive feedback. We're talking about um, a system where in the past there's essentially been this you know, very stable freezer up here, a white surface, relatively thick ice that reflected uh, incoming uh, sunlight very well during the you know, summer months of relatively high insulation under close to 24 hours of, uh, of daylight. As you start to lose some of that ice, you now have an extremely dark surface, very effective at absorbing sunlight. You warm the upper ocean, which then can melt a little more ice, which makes it easier to warm things more and melt even more ice. That's a positive feedback. It's not the only feedback, positive or negative, uh, in play here. We can also imagine things like how cloud cover might respond to ice loss. You know, less clear what a change in cloud cover would mean. Would that be a positive feedback or a negative feedback in total? I wouldn't uh, argue that we necessarily know the answer to that. There are uncertainties. But this solar radiative feedback is a clear and powerful positive feedback. And we think there are probably some others. You lose some of that sea ice. The ice behind it is no longer protected from ocean waves that can penetrate further, breaking up the ice further. Maybe storms are more able to penetrate into the Arctic as they have sources of moisture, where in the past they just had a very dry surface. Certainly natural variability, part of the story um, in Arctic sea ice loss. But when I tell you that you know, relative to three or four decades, maybe five decades ago, We've lost anywhere between 50 and 75% of the volume of that late summer Arctic sea ice. That's far more than climate models predicted. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, and again, happening faster than models uh, predicted. You do have to wonder from a risk management perspective, you know, whether there could be, could be a tipping point there. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I won't claim that we know what the consequences would be, you know, for mid-latitude weather, uh, for one thing. Um, but again, from a risk management perspective, um, if we have something that climate models don't capture well, we have to be concerned that it, that, that it could have implications on things that we've taken for granted, like you know, mid-latitude mid uh, weather patterns. So just to quickly describe what you're seeing here, this is essentially um, the climatology 
um, for end of July, when you know, if you look over a 30-year period from 81 to 2010, you expected that boundary to be on average, uh, and then this is this year. And if we think of this um, another way, this is extent or area. This is not volume, so this is not showing the vertical dimension. This is just area. But you can see here, um, typical May, typical July into August, you know, the long-term average uh, for late July, where we are now, something on the order of 8.5 million square kilometers. This year, down around seven. Um, you know, where will we go? But the key point here, again, um, if we look at what's the worst year to date, 2012, from an area extent, that was, you know, more than 50% below the long-term average and far outside of a sort of two standard deviation, what it had been experienced, you know, roughly 90% of the time or more. Since climate models didn't predict this, since we know there are positive feedbacks, we have to wonder, again, from a risk management perspective, whether if that gets further or if it combines with natural variability that's not in its favor, could you run away to an ice-free uh, Arctic summer state? Uh, I would argue that's certainly not something uh, that, that can be ruled out at this point. Uh, quickly to talk about ocean ecosystems, you know, far too complicated a story to, to get into here. Um, as we think about um, impacts in the oceans, we know ocean acidification becoming much more of a problem. This is another of the just absolutely airtight uh, aspects of climate science as, as carbon dioxide levels increase due to human activities. We know there are going to be huge impacts, even though we don't understand them all, um, on ecosystems. But to focus here on something, again, that this NOAA report highlighted uh, that was released uh, yesterday, coral reefs, we think, are extremely sensitive um, uh, and that already we may be beginning to see sea surface temperatures that are pushing up against what these uh, coral systems can manage. We've had a you know, major bleaching event, a 95% uh, mortality in some coral reef regions over the last three years. Uh, one of those years uh, was not an El Nino when, when ocean temperatures would, would be expected to be a little bit higher. Are we already um, coming up against the point where um, uh, some of these coral systems especially can't manage the higher temperatures combined um, with, with some other changes we're observing in the, uh, in the ocean? There are still wild cards. To what extent will some of these species be able to adapt? Um, I don't claim to know that, but we, but we certainly shouldn't take it as a given as we push SSTs um, beyond what they've been um, uh, sea surface temperatures in, in, in recent experience. The fire and drought story, um, very complicated as well, but clearly a climate signal. There are a lot of other signals as well. Um, forest management practices in the Western US, people moving more and more into these wooey um, wildland urban interfaces. Certainly that's part of the story. Um, but we're learning more and more as well about possible tipping points and how a little bit of temperature change, especially temperature increase, can have a profound impact um, on fire risk in con and drought risk in conjunction with some of those other factors um, not directly related to climate change that I just mentioned. The quick version of the story, um, whether you're talking about soil moisture or uh, moisture in vegetation and, and fire risk and drought, precipitation is only part of that story. And even as they're are real legitimate uncertainties in a lot of places about how precipitation is going to change in the future. Not something in, in many regions, in some regions that we understand very well. Natural variability may continue to dominate for annual precipitation in a, in a lot of areas for a long time. Um, but temperature has broken through in most of these areas. The climate change signal due to our activities is beginning to dominate. Um, and that has a big impact um, on fire risk. So just to, you know, do a little uh, cherry pick here. This is owned in on one important region of the US, California. If you look at winter precipitation uh, for a lot of California, you know, the, the, essentially most of California, the key season, um, no clear uh, signal, probably decadal, yearly variability jumps out much more than any long term uh, trend. But when we look at temperature, we see a very different story, still year to year and decadal variability, but also, again, thinking about how the statistics have shifted. You can still arguably, um, you know, get a cool year, close to a cool year. There's still a lot of year to year variability, but the statistics have shifted. You now plan for a warmer year. Uh, how does that um, impact uh, these systems? As temperatures rise, um, you can have much more evaporation because that warmer air can hold more moisture. 
you have that snow reservoir um, becoming less effective either because it's melting earlier in the presence of these warming temperatures or because some of it's not falling as snow in the in the first place it's falling uh, as rain instead as temperatures you know during some events or some elevations push above uh, 32 and it's not getting stored you put all that together um, uh, impacts on how quickly vegetation dries out and part of the story of fire risk. I don't mean to say that it's the dominant story, but um, clear sort of physical understanding of why it, uh, why it ought to impact uh, fire risk. And this is just one set of scenarios, uh, Ben Cook and all here, here at Lamont Dougherty a few years ago, putting together in climate model simulations, combined impacts of higher temperatures and precipitation. Um, this animation basically just showing, you don't have to focus on the details, just look at you know, order of magnitude type of changes conceptually, you see that risk of, uh, of, of drought increasing um, with time. Okay, um, I need to pick up my pace a little bit. I'm bogging down a little bit. I apologize for that. I'm about to shift gears and start talking about compound extremes. Last slide before we do so. I just told you about a few components of the climate system um, and how they individually could change. Arctic sea ice, land-based ice, a little bit of allusion to uh, sea surface temperatures, sea level rise. But really, we also, from this tipping point perspective, need to be thinking about the interaction uh, between these components. Um, are our climate models able to capture the ways that these different systems, including the carbon cycle, human comp the uh, you know, vegetation, um, uh, living organism components all interact um, that may be a source of additional uh, uncertainties and, and feedbacks in different directions okay now let's shift to the other uh, main component of this talk compound extremes so showing you an image here uh, of a day uh, last last summer early fall last summer i believe three tropical cyclones simultaneously um, in the atlantic that might give you a hint um, of what we're going to be talking about here. When I'm talking about compound um, extreme events, there are really sort of at least three dimensions to this. But a compound extreme event could be multivariate. By that, I mean two variables. This could be, going back to our last example, thinking about a hurricane, not just in terms of the storm surge that it might deliver to an unfortunate coastline, but also simultaneously in terms of the heavy rain that might be falling during that event. And as sea levels push higher, um, how does that relationship between the flooding associated with rainfall and the flooding associated with surge uh, change? There could be some nonlinear surprises uh, there in terms of that multivariate dimension. But we're also talking about correlation through space, either during existing patterns of climate variability, things like El Nino, or in the context of a changing climate, are we going to see more or less instances of a certain type of extreme weather event, maybe it's a hurricane, maybe it's a fire, maybe it's a heat wave or, or a drought, occurring simultaneously um, in multiple regions, either in a basin or maybe around the globe. And as we start to think about impacts, food security, uh, ability of flood insurance programs to manage some of these risks, potential for failures, um, are we thinking about the correlated structure in space? and how that might change simply because of averages shifting. Remember how we saw in the initial slides, uh, pulling up the average conditions a little bit, temperature or sea level can itself in a nonlinear way impact extreme event frequency. But could there also be shared patterns? Um, could the jet stream change in a way that's separate from that sort of rising tide lifting all ships or whatever the expression is, actually changes um, processes in a way that either augment or decrease some of those, some of those extreme event risks? Could the jet stream shift in ways that, that decreases the probability of certain types of extremes? All things, or increases, all things that, that people are thinking a lot um, about. And then also correlation through time. For a given place, we need to be thinking more about what sequential events might do. Um, so you have a hurricane, knocks the power out. You have a heat wave thereafter or a cold air outbreak thereafter um, when you either don't have your electric supply or, or energy grid or you're vulnerable in other ways. How well do we understand those risks in the present climate in the context of climate variability? And then as the climate changes, 
Are those risks going to, are those hazards going to, those joint hazards going to change in nonlinear ways? And then is our societal system sensitive to uh, nonlinear impacts and, and consequences as well? So we don't have time to uh, go into this in a ton of detail. I'll work through a couple quick examples. Multivariate. So here we're looking at combined events where it's both dry, where, where it's either dry or wet on the horizontal axis or hot or cold on the vertical axis. So what you can see here is if we look at major drought events shown in brown and their magnitude is, is shown by the size of the circle, fire in red, you can see perhaps not surprisingly that you got to be thinking in this joint space to understand this risk. If you just looked at precipitation on the horizontal axis or just looked at temperature, You've missed the story. It's really this, uh, this this interaction, and the vast majority of these events, um, you know, happen when you're in that hot and dry uh, space. Uh, for example, for these for these variables, how will those relationships change in the future? My group has been um, doing a lot of work these days on the combined impacts of high temperature and high humidity. What we find is that. As we look towards the future, again, with that just sort of small amount of additional warming, that next you know, half a degree or degree um, Celsius, the frequency of these events with high temperature and high humidity actually increases faster than the frequencies for temperature alone. You don't have to go as far into the future to reach a point where you're having two, five times as many days with extreme high temperature humidity combinations um, those become more frequent a lot faster uh, than temperature alone, even though temperature alone is rapidly um, occurring much more often than it did in the past. And we do think that there are real thresholds of what the human body can handle in terms of high temperature, high humidity combinations. More and more of the world um, beginning to push towards some of those thresholds. You know, by a wet bulb um, of, of 31 Celsius, outdoor labor also already becoming difficult. Anyone with pre-existing um, health conditions, very young, the elderly, anyone who doesn't have a perfect access to water or shade, um, gonna be suffering um, at wet bulbs even lower than um, 31 Celsius. So this is another of these emergent um, joint risks. And of course, on the societal impact side, there could be real nonlinearities as well. well. We'll talk a little bit about that. This is what we project for uh, how often different regions could experience these, these devastating wet bulbs um, later this century if we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So oh, that's unfortunate. Um, this was a, I'm presuming that you guys don't see this since I can't. Um, this is basically meant to show uh, that El Nino um, induces consistent crop yield anomalies around the world. Um, a pattern of natural variability um, generates correlated structure where certain regions um, both have elevated risk of, of crop failures. Um, this, was, this was shown corn specifically. Um, so as we plan, um, uh, we need to, need to, we can't just look at each place in isolation. Um, just to sort of, you know, give an example uh, of something that's been in the news lately, you know, uh, this is just, you know, one day, um, I put it up here only just to sort of get folks thinking, not to try to make an attribution statement or anything. but as we look to the future, as we see um, that shift in average temperatures going up, will we see a linear response in terms of temperature? This is showing you the temperature anomalies, departures from the average for the day uh, near the surface across the globe. Or will we see uh, maybe some changes in structure whereby the risk of multiple regions experiencing simultaneous extreme heat could go up or go down? This is just one day, um, but there's more and more research looking at whether we're seeing shifts in the jet stream, not, not just in winter, but now more and more in summer too, that might lead to more of these sort of amplified patterns, whereby if the jet stream is north of you, very hot to your south, jet stream is south of you, cold to the north, anomalous weather, standing wave patterns, it's not that everybody's warm in this context, although we do see that shift in averages, but that some places, many places at once are very warm. And the other element that I can't show you here is, is the jet stream stuck in place relative to what it's tended to be in the past? Is it less likely to be progressing west to east? Not to suggest that it always progresses west to east. You've always had the ability to get sort of a stuck jet stream where weather stagnates for days on end. 
but there's some evidence suggesting um, that that could become more common uh, in the future. At this point, it's fair to fair to say that the way I, the way I just put it is not sort of overstating the science. Now, from a risk management perspective, this is on a lot of people's minds, in part because the consequences um, would be so uh, catastrophic if we do see emergent uh, weather patterns uh, that climate models don't handle that well. Still an if, but I think you know, given the potential consequences, it's it's worthy of further research for sure. And another argument for not uh, pushing the climate system through increasing emissions. Sequential extremes in one place, presuming there are a fair number of folks from DC on the line, thinking back to the derecho of June 2012. You know, derechos have always happened. I'm not going to get into whether they'll become more common or not in the future. But as you know, have we built our systems planning for the idea that sequential events can happen? What if your power goes out because of a derecho? What if your power goes out because of a nor'easter or a hurricane, you name it? Um, simply by virtue of average temperatures going up and having more frequent heat waves, that suggests greater risk um, of, uh, of not having access to air conditioning and being vulnerable in other ways um, as, you, as you lose access to critical resources after these storms. So how do we plan in the present climate for these kind of joint hazards? And how do we assess potentially nonlinear ways that um, probability of these joint hazards might change. Another example of sequential risk that's getting some attention these days, this idea of are there certain years when cities like Boston, New York might, might be uh, more likely to see sequences of nor'easters um, in a way that might, um, you know, small effects, you might argue things like, you know, cutting into your salt supply uh, all the way out to bigger effects such as, you know, risk of, of running low on, uh, you know, winter heating fuels, for example. These are things things people are thinking about. Um, now, as we sort of begin to wrap up, um, there are also the surprises on the impact side. This is outside the purview um, of this chapter. Much of what I've talked about actually, you know, I'd say, you know, went beyond uh, what we talked about in the climate science special report. But there are going to be, um, you know, nonlinear uh, impacts on the, on the impact side. You know, at some point, a certain amount of sea level rise has implications um, for existential uh, risks for low island nations, arguably, you know, you know, large delta populations as well. Here in the US, um, for certain applications, some areas matter more than others. If you lose, you know, your only or one of a couple, um, you know, nation critical launch capacities either due to sea level rise um, with climate change um, or just sort of baseline threats associated with being very close um, to the ocean, that has implications um, not just for those living uh, right in the area. How do we plan for um, and account for um, cascading impacts uh, of some of these climate extremes and climate changes? Okay. Some of these tipping point systems that I mentioned earlier, there's been some recent research suggesting Again, there's uncertainties here, where these thresholds might lie for various systems. Remember, we've already had, uh, where's my cursor, about a degree Celsius uh, of warming. It depends on exactly what uh, baseline you, lose, you use. Um, these are future emission scenarios. Um, so we can sort of start to think about the two degree Celsius Paris target, three degrees, four degrees. Looks like some of these systems um, based on our best understanding, um, aren't viable, even with just a little bit more warming um, or with warming that we're going to experience unless we dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So that's part of the, the basis for this you know, argument for why um, you know, decarbonization is necessary to, if the goal is to avert some of these uh, impacts. A study from several years ago now suggested that if we wanted to have a 50% chance of not blowing through the two degrees Celsius target, again, keeping in mind that we're now close to a degree Celsius already and we're locked into some more warming, we'd have roughly 27 years, again, this study, several years old now, to emit uh, globally at the levels we've been emitting at, at which point emissions would have to fall uh, to zero. So you start to understand the scope um, of the challenge and, and, and why there, there, there are such arguments for, for rapid decarbonization. And some of these things you know, uh, are irreversible, even uh, we think if, if at some point in the future we developed a, a, a technology to extract carbon from the air, which 
you know, at, at scale and cost, which I, which I do think, you know, can't be ruled out as a possibility, uh, even though it's, it's uh, not plausible today. Um, so key points, last couple slides. Before we even got to the nature of my talk, I wanted to hit what to me is maybe the you know, most important point of, this, of the CSSR. Uh, the statistics of many types of extreme events have already shifted in recent decades, just um, in the presence of small amounts of global warming and small amounts of sea level rise. As long as greenhouse gas concentrations continue to rise, and we are locked into some additional increases, we expect to see an acceleration of the changes in those extreme event statistics. See them becoming, the things that are becoming more common, becoming more common faster. But now into the subject of this talk, the further we push the system, the greater the potential for these surprises of the type that I've talked about uh, today. But critically, um, you know, I do think that as we talk about surprises, there are possibility for surprises in the solution space that can't be discounted as well. Innovations in greenhouse gas mitigation, um, adaptation. Very hard to quantify, but I think we can't rule out the potential for rapid surprises um, in that space uh, too, as, as sort of captured um, by this graphic. Um, last slide or two, um, just to show the complexity of some of these issues. Here you're seeing uh, for New York City by decade, the, you know, the, 19, the decade of the 1900s here, 1900, 1910, and then the decade of the 2000s here. You see two things for all these decades, a very nonlinear impact relationship whereby each additional degree of warming on a really, uh, each additional degree of, of temperature on a really hot day produces disproportionately more impact, uh, risk of death, um, than the warming did in prior days. These are steep curves, but they're also a lot less steep now in the presence of adaptation, air conditioning and other measures, healthier population, heat warning systems than they were in the past. As we push these systems further, how nonlinear are these slopes going to be? To what extent can adaptation minimize some of these impacts? This is New York City, arguably sort of the, the best case scenario one could, one could claim for adaptation. The rest of the world is not going to, um, uh, is not going to have, have, have the same profile and is also experiencing temperatures further out on the tail. But those are the kind of things, you know, we're, we're deep uncertainties on the solution side and on the impact side. We think about futures, um, you know, some renewable energy sources reaching parity um, with fossil fuels, that kind of thing can lead to societal tipping points. Um, visions of new adaptation strategies, um, responsibilities that companies, expectations of investors that companies disclose their greenhouse gas emissions, disclose their vulnerabilities to extreme events and climate change that they're lot, that's already locked into. I believe that these also pose potential for real and rapid um, tipping points um, uh, in, in, and reputational risk uh, that is also, uh, you know, very difficult to, to quantify, but could, could lead to rapid um, innovations in the mitigation and, and adaptation uh, space. With that, I'll close. Um, I apologize for not leaving time, much time for questions. I can stay on um, for a few more minutes if. Um, if the system will, will support that. Thank you. Great, thanks Radley, wow. Anybody have any questions? You can type your question into the chat box. Um, I know uh, Radley has to, uh-oh, okay, has to go shortly, but we have time for a few questions. Radley, can you see the chat box? Yes. Okay, great. I see people are busy typing. Multiple attendees. Yeah. Bradley, can you talk about one or two innovations in gas mitigation or adaptation that you think is really promising? Yeah, great question. And you, this a little outside my area of expertise, but you know, let, let me let me see what I can what I can tell on this. I mean, I think that um, you know, in that sort of space where we're maybe not quite there yet in terms of price parity, but where you're seeing rapid change, um, energy storage technologies, um, as we know, solar and wind um, are intermittent and not always generated where we need the power the most. So. Um, 
you know, innovations in battery storage technologies and potential for transmission. Also, um, smart technologies that um, reduce our energy usage that, that are making contributions to energy efficiency. I think those would be a few examples. You know, my sort of, you know, sense is that, you know, we are starting to see some hints of systems that can, in principle, do a little bit of carbon capture, extraction from the air. But I think it's fair to say right now that none of them are at scale um, or any anywhere near sort of you know cost vi viability. But but that's a space to watch because you know over the coming decades that, um, that 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 could definitely change. But what's interesting is that solar and wind you know generation costs uh, have already hit that critical uh, threshold, and, and there are parts of the world where. Subsidies are what are keeping fossil fuel, um, you know, some types of uh, fossil fuel generation alive. Okay, thank you. Guest number three asks, what are decision makers in the Northeast U.S. most concerned about when you give this kind of talk? Well, wow, that's another really good question. I would say, so one thing I'd say in the Northeast, I think, you know, this, this, this is where I'm based. I, I don't know other parts of the U.S. or the world quite as well. But I've been struck in New York, for example, you know, over a decade now, we've been talking about the possibility that sea level could rise um, six feet, you know, far before, um, you know, most groups were talking about that worst case scenario. And I think it's fair to say that the stakeholders, um, to a large extent, you know, em embrace that science. They were comfortable with the uncertainty. Um, there were instances where we were invited to um, articulate more about the kind of worst case scenarios. So I think that um, high-end sea level rise is something that they're very comfortable thinking about. I think more and more heat is on people's minds. We're learning more and more um, uh, about how heat kills. It doesn't always show up as a heat death, but if you look at the cardiovascular, respiratory, kidney disease, a lot of those ramp up um, during heat events. In a lot of parts of the Northeast, air quality also tends to be lower when temperatures are higher. There's a joint effect there. That's on a lot of people's minds. Even as we're learning more and more about um, how productivity um, and, and health are impacted by, by extreme heat. I also think we're starting to see some signs um, among some of the thought leaders of getting beyond this mode of just looking at local projections for your place. You know, understanding some of these cascading impacts and how um, corridors like I-95, our highways, Amtrak, our electric grids, um, maybe as vulnerable to extreme weather and climate changes upstream or downstream as they are in, in, in local changes. Those are, those are some of the things we're, we're hearing about, I'd say, on the climate side. Okay. And Jane Heinz Fry asks, what about interaction, interactions among changes, Arctic sea ice loss, sulfates loss, water vapor, and cloud changes? Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I sort of just vaguely hinted at that in the context of that, that graphic that showed the system components. Yeah, I mean, you know, the real world includes all those types of, uh, of interactions. And, um, you know, I think that uh, models are improving, but, you know, we need to, uh, need to acknowledge the fact that, that, that we're probably missing some system components. <sighs> We're starting to hear more and more a narrative about, you know, asking experts to develop sort of storylines, thinking about how these components, you know, could fit together. Um, I think there are any number of examples uh, like you just articulated. Um, just to, you know, tell a very quick story. Um, you know, I, you might you heard, might have heard me say sea ice, Arctic sea ice loss doesn't impact sea level rise. Um, it's probably actually not quite that simple, right? Because... If you lose Arctic sea ice, you change the temperature of the high latitudes, you change the temperature of air getting advected or pushed towards the Greenland ice sheet, you change the amount of moisture in air that's getting pushed towards the Greenland ice sheet, you may change the storminess, the cloudiness of, of air um, over Greenland. How is that going to impact uh, the ice sheet stability? How is it going to change ocean circulation um, in ways that might feed back on the sea ice? It might feed back on the Greenland ice sheet. How might it change the Greenland ice sheet's water runoff in ways that impacted ocean circulation, which, by the way, affects sea level rise along the whole northeast coast. So obviously I, I didn't do that explanation justice, but I just wanted to point uh, at some of the complexities, some of the ways that all these systems are connected. And I think the key point, you know, that, that, that I, some would disagree, but from my perspective, we still have a lot more experts and in individual uh, systems that I mentioned 
fewer people, um, you know, thinking about tail risks when you put it all together, um, you know, how some of these systems might interact. It, it's really challenging. It's not an expertise that I have, but I think from a risk management perspective, we need more people trying to think that way. Okay, um, Bradley, I don't know how, do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you want to look through them and pick the ones you want to address, or do you want me to just go top to bottom? I sort of like your system. I, I feel like they're, they're coming in a little faster than I'm able to, yeah, let's, if, let's keep, keep going with what we're doing, if that's all right with you. Sure. So Tim Mock asks, what is behind greenhouse gas increase going from linear to exponential? So I don't know what this. I don't know if this is referring to um, changes in recent years. I would argue that um, you know, basically, basically, there is some potential in the future. Um, you know, as temperatures continue to rise, some of these systems could shift in ways that modify once we emit, you know, carbon. How quickly it's taken up by the ocean, by the biosphere whether there's actually um, outgassing of, of, of stored carbon to the atmosphere. I, my, I think based on my limited understanding that, you know, in recent years, we haven't seen any sort of dramatic shifts. Um, what we're seeing, um, you know, at least up until the last couple of years where there's been a little bit of leveling in the global um, emissions. Um, basically, the story has been upticks of a few parts per million um, uh, in carbon dioxide concentrations uh, every year. Um, there's a little bit of variability year to year. El Nino cycles uh, impact it. But I think the first order story is concentrations continue to go up. Um, it's actually been a fairly well behaved uh, system relative to, to some of these other systems. If you start to go further out into the future, um, you know, there, there is potential for you know, bigger changes in behavior, either on the emissions side um, or, on the, or on the sort of uptake and biological uh, system side. Okay, and then we have a question from guest. Can you com comment on permafrost tipping point probabilities? You know, I, 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 I probably don't have much more expertise on this than, uh, than most of you. I mean, what I would say is that, um, you know, I, my, my perception is that, um, you know, this is something that the IPCC, that, you know, science communities are really looking at. And it's a, you know, there's, there's a tipping point there that we can't rule out. The most likely scenario, um, we talk about this in the chapter, is that as temperatures continue to rise, you know, there is going to be more permafrost thawing, melting. That is going to release some methane uh, carbon, you know, further we push the system. The risk goes up that we're no longer the sort of central arbiters of carbon and methane emissions. But the balance of evidence suggests, I would say, that we're not yet, not yet approaching a point where we lose that control. But we could be approaching a point where it's a bigger part of, of the story, you know, where where um, it's it, it's contributing in a you know enough to offset you know uh, emissions reductions by some countries, but. Um, my intuition is that it's unlikely to be a sort of um, true rapid tipping point um, unless we push the system a lot further based on what we currently know. But, but I, I wouldn't discount it you know, completely as a risk. And if we push the system far enough and if we talk about longer time scales, it becomes a much bigger issue. The, oh. the idea here basically is just that you know, the permafrost um, and eventually the methane uh, hydrates, um, you know, do hold enormous stores um, of historical, you know, living matter uh, stored as carbon and, and methane. So to the extent that we release even some of that, it's, you know, it impacts this carbon budget further and gives us more of a surplus. Okay. And uh, I think basically one question left, Joanna uh, Stansel asked, what do you, what, do you see as trends in relocation of populations due to extreme weather events? Well, this is like um, you know one of the one of the hottest topics around. I would say trends um, in population movements, um, also more and more discussion about managed retreat. The idea that you know for some places we may not be that far from the point where um, it's not viable. Um, to, to sort of adapt adapt in place. Some places will be able to for a while, some won't. More generally, um, I would say that, um, you know, what do we know? We know that 
there are a lot of forces that can drive um, migration. We know climate is often a big part of the story. I mean, we could look to things right, like Katrina, um, huge impact on New Orleans to this day. Um, in a climate change context, we could look at recent events that have many drivers, things like um, drought, strife, changes in food prices that have impacted a lot of the world, including parts of the Middle East. Clearly, there are many components to that story, but there's more and more research suggesting that climate change signal uh, through higher temperatures may be a factor that's contributed to um, some of that political instability, some of that conflict, some of that migration. So I would think that um, as sea levels continue to rise, we're going to see more and more places immediately um, experiencing uh, migration, either after extreme events or as the reality eventually sets in that um, some of these real estate prices uh, are not viable in the long term. That's you know, ultimately going to drive migration, at least in those places where um, you know, adaptation in place isn't viable, that, that, that subcomponent of those places. But then there's also these other areas where it's going to be sort of indirect effects um, uh, through conflict, through food security. Um, Migration is going to be is, is becoming a huge, um, a huge story. And I think I think poised to become much more so when you look at huge populations living in, in Delta regions or regions that are vulnerable from an agricultural perspective. If, if temperatures just get a little higher, given background vulnerabilities. So. Gave you a pretty vague answer, but I'd say we're already seeing it to some extent, and it's it's a, it's another of these potential you know, huge uh, huge tipping points. Uh, you know, a major issue of the next next couple decades, and one that we'd be better off being ahead of and, and thinking about in advance rather than uh, rather than in a reactive way. I should probably okay. um, sign off with that. Um, okay. But thank you. There are a few more questions. Well, thank you so much, Bradley, for taking the time. Folks, thanks for joining us today. The recording um, of this presentation will be online. You can, uh, I just pasted the recording into the chat box. If you want to look for that, you will be able to find it. Thanks again, Bradley, for joining us and presenting this terrific work. Thank you. Thank hey, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Katie.